Hey y'all, I'm finishing up on this uh, Word of God and I hope that y'all stay with me through the parts because I feel like these scriptures, um, the reason that I'm offering them to you is because they have done so much for me and I was hoping that it might um, inspire you, it might... Um, in a time that we're really, really down, that it might give you, I know this is gonna sound weird to say this, y'all, but give you joy. Even though we are hearing about people dying, even though we are hearing about the spread of this virus, even though we are have other concerns, that's not all that's going on, it's just what's grabbing the news of the day, but some people have other issues going on. I had a friend the other day that told me to pray for her because her marriage was in trouble. I've had people say, will you pray for me because um, I have health conditions and not coronavirus they are dealing with another health condition I've had people ask me will you pray for me because I am a caregiver and I am about worn out but I, I, it's not that I don't want to it's that I'm just I'm worn out and so just pray for me to keep continue to have strength I, I have people who have said you know Beth I've lost my job and I'm thankful that you haven't lost your job at Chick-fil-a but I have lost my job and I'm frightened I'm scared and so people still have issues um, in their life, you know. So I just feel like we need some joy. We need some encouragement. Do you know the word encouragement? I haven't ever looked it up. Go look it up as a definition. But you know what I do notice? that There's a word in there. I just kind of made up a definition in my mind. Courage. You are minted in courage. You know how when you mint a, a, a coin, you know, you imprint it? We're imprinted with courage. That's how I'm going to look at that. I know that's probably not the Webster's Dictionary version. If you're wondering what I'm doing down here, I was in the middle of doing a makeup video, as you know, and I put on my mascara real quick and it went off. And so I'm coming back, and as you know, whenever you use an eyelash curler, you always wipe it off with your little makeup. Um, and I, your makeup cloth, and honestly, mine says makeup on it. It's all cute because it says that, but really just get you. Um, some dark colored um, wash rags that from the dollar store or just the cheapy cheapy ones of a few dollars and have about five of them and just you know each day you need to probably change them out um, if I get them dirty enough that I change them out daily if not it doesn't have to have the word makeup on it I think I got this from makeup exclusively made by the Turkish Towel Company www.turkishtowelcompany.com or 1866 631-1676 if you want this this particular makeup towel, towel that's it but you don't have to you can get a navy blue you can get black you can get brown anything that's dark so that you single this out from the rest of your towels that you know that I, well I have white towels and because of, we bleach them and until they're just so bleached they're falling apart and then we throw them away but um, the reason I'm telling you that is have something that's just for makeup so that you don't mess up your other towels so you will always remember to clean off your eyelash curler because even if your your eyes are clean you know when I, when I clean my um my makeup brushes when I clean my face up all, off at night and I use um, the Neutrogena even uh, waterproof mascara wipes it doesn't have a lot of little fibers in it that get stuck in your eyelashes takes all the makeup off and then of course even after that you have the residual of the makeup remover on you so you need to wash your hands, get off your hands, and then with whatever water's left on your face, rub it in on that makeup remover, and then use a towel to take even that off. And you know what you'll find? You have even more residual coming off on that towel. That's hard as to clean, how hard it is to clean all this stuff off. <laughs> I still enjoy it. It's like paint. We know it is paint. So anyway, so I was talking about Jesus and everything, and, uh, <laughs> And one of the scriptures that I had quoted to you, or was fixing to quote to you when it cut off, um, was about the debt that he paid um, at the cross. And why does that matter? Because ultimately, y'all, there is a big scare of this virus, and it's because people are dying. Um, or could die. And it sends fear into people and panic into people. But do you know what? As Christians, yes, at the onset, our, our fleshly nature is to be afraid. But then we have to stop and we have to remember we have nothing to fear in death. 
because of what Jesus did on the cross. You see, every single person's going to die of something. So the fear is based on death itself, not fear of that virus or this virus or this accident or this disease or this injury or just the natural processes of living. Some people just die of old age. It's, you know, their heart just finally stops, which we all hope for that'll happen while we're asleep and we don't have to suffer. No one wants to suffer. But you know that we're actually honored when we suffer for Christ as being like him? Is there a bigger honor? Think about that. Well, we were talking about the fact that what Jesus did on the cross was the sacrifice that he made there was what was required for sin, for justice to be served. For debts to be paid. And in Hebrews, I, if y'all ever wonder, because sometimes y'all say, you know, Beth, I don't really have a, a Bible study um, booklet or I don't have any, you know, devotional guidelines or anything like that. What would you suggest I do? I would suggest you pick a book of the Bible and just read it. Sometimes people want to read from the very beginning to the very end. That's very good. I would suggest that if you're going to start, start with the New Testament. Testament, the New Covenant. We're going to talk about what that is. And read from Matthew to Revelation. And then read from Genesis to the end of the Bible. All the way to the end again where you read back through the New Testament. But if you just want to start a study that doesn't seem overwhelming to you and long term like that, that's fine. I get it. Just pick a book of the Bible. My suggestion is always the Gospel of John. The book of John, to me, John knew Jesus better than anyone, in my opinion, because he was—he appears to have been his best friend there most of the time. And um, the book of John is different than the other three, they call the synoptics, the other three uh, Gospels, <clears throat> and the way that it's written. It skips his beginning as a little boy. It starts right in with talking about his deity from his best friend who knew him best. Interesting. But another book of the Bible that I would suggest that you just start reading is the book of Hebrews. Again, starts with the deity of God. No one's quite sure who wrote it. Some people say um, historically it's believed that it was written by John, but it, I mean um, Paul, but it, uh, a letter to the Hebrews because he was in the letter writing business, but it doesn't bear his style, which that may or may not, you know, there could be different reasons for that. Especially if he had it scribed and it was stylistically different simply for that reason. But also, they're not quite sure. But anyway, I think the important thing that they are sure of is um, that God himself, whomever he gave the inspiration to pen what he inspired, made sure that it got down right. Even what I was telling you all about earlier, about this... Um, this is a life application. I don't know if you can see. It's so heavy, y'all. Can you see it? The Life Application Study Bible. Y'all, this is such a big Bible. Look how thick. <laughs> but, um, this one had a first and second edition, and they messed up a scripture. And, I mean, they actually mistranslated it, and it was so important that when they realized it, that they wrote a whole new edition. The NLT first edition really shouldn't be read. I don't know that they pulled it off the shelves, but they should have. Um, but they came out with this whole new Bible for my understanding is one scripture in it. That was John 8 58 because it needs to say in the second edition it does say um, before Abraham existed I am and it even references Exodus 3 14 because that was the name of God and that was Jesus claiming that as his name and some of you um, a, a couple one or two of you have said I am pulling together uh, a couple I think it was a, a couple of gentlemen had said that I am pulling together scriptures that simply do not go together well all I have to say to that is you pray about that and if Jesus said before Abraham existed I am isn't that an odd sentence I am is a proper noun. It is a name. So it's like saying, before Joe existed, Beth. And the 
the Pharisees of that day understood what he meant was that he was claiming that name to himself because they it says and they picked up stones to stone him they would stone you for blasphemy um, so yes that was very important but anyway so when I am reading this scripture of Hebrews and talking about these scriptures who point that Jesus is God I also want to look at what Jesus did and why he came and if I mean you really should read the whole book but I'm just starting in chapter 10 verse 8 and really it's talking about some stuff right before that you really should read as well but it kind of summarizes it starting again and in, in chapter 8 and I'm just going to read it to you it's 8 through 18 first Jesus this is in the NLT First, Jesus said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law of Moses. So that's the Old Covenant. Uh, animal sacrifices were in lieu of human sacrifice, meaning when you sin, that equals death. So you have to give a blood sacrifice of your own self. God did not want us to die. He wants us to live. He wants us to have a relationship with Him forever. So He allowed a substitutionary sacrifice of animals. Who It's a sacrifice. He loved them. He did not want you to sacrifice them, but it was better than sacrificing a, a human being yourself. And so He wasn't pleased with it. They had to do it repeatedly. It wasn't enough. So let's keep reading. In verse 9 He said, this is... Um, Jesus talking. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second one into effect. Isn't that interesting? For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice